Thanks, Bailey. And um, good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending upon where you are watching. Um, I'd just like to thank Bailey and uh, Alex, everyone at PUSH uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I really I really do appreciate them uh, thinking of me and giving me this opportunity. Uh, this is going to be very different than probably some of the ones you've seen on uh, velocity-based training. Um, so more of the, uh, the, the layman's version of what we're doing here. So it's basically about implementing and evolving with uh, velocity-based training. And then uh, what we came up with was what we call start slow and grow. So our experience with uh, velocity-based training to this point, uh, since our initial startup with it. So first off, uh, I guess I'd just like to talk a little bit about me or who I am. And it, it does play into a little bit about velocity-based training and it will uh, as, we, as we move along. Uh, first off, uh, my name is Bob Gamartin. I'm the Director of Football Sports Performance for Columbia University. Um, I've been here since late spring of 2014. Uh, prior to that uh, arrival, I had spent a couple seasons in the NFL with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And prior to that, my college experience was uh, strictly at Rutgers University from uh, 2001 on, when, when Coach Giano was initially first hired uh, for his first stint there. So over 20 plus years of experience. Before that, I had a, a private business um, before moving into the college realms. Uh, the next thing I just want to talk, uh, touch on is, uh, I, I wrote that I, I would be considered an old school coach, uh, and not because I'm old, um, but the style of coaching. So you wonder, and it's important because it, it plays into what we we're doing with velocity-based training and then where we're going with it or where we want to go and, and where I see myself going with it. Um, I learned from, uh, and I'll go through some of the people I learned from, but I, I coach in a way where no one in the room has their own sheet. Uh, no one in the room is, has their own phone. Uh, we train in a group style, a group format. And uh, I believe it's the most effective way to train. Um, it's it's my, my personal philosophy and how we train. Um, so you come into the room, we have a, a, a large group warm up. We'll break out to where we're gonna break out to. Um, and then we train and I conduct the lift. Okay, so there's no, you're not going off your own tempo. The, the athlete isn't, uh, they're not following a card again, they're not following the phone. I'm setting that tempo off a whistle. Okay, so some would call that a militaristic style. I, I guess maybe it is. Um, but you control the rest intervals, uh, you control the structure of what you're doing. It does not mean that athletes aren't performing their own work so a db maybe is definitely doing something different than alignment however we're performing it together um we conduct it the same way that football practice is conducted so what happens in the room is gonna is gonna mimic what's gonna happen outside uh there are also factors involved in that style of coaching that have to do with the room you have the size of the group you have um, so and again that that's gonna play into where I'm going with velocity-based training and how things are going to change, right? So understanding that I'm, I, I do train the team in that style. Um, and then it also plays in with how the room is set up, okay? So how we coach the athletes in the room. Um, and it'll, all, it'll make a little more sense um, when I move into the next couple slides on what we're doing. Um, okay, so enough about me. Um, why am I doing it? So why was why did uh, Bailey and, and, and Alex and I discuss this and, and, and why did we want to talk about it? Um, I guess first and foremost, <laughs> this is definitely not a science-based presentation about velocity-based training, okay? So if that was something you were looking for, this is definitely not the talk for that. Um, this is more about practical application, all right? So anything that has to do with the science, the theory, um, that's Dr. Dr. Mann. Uh, definitely not me, and anyone who knows me knows that's that's true. So this is about selecting the system, okay, and then learning the system, using the system, what's happened, what we thought was going to happen, what happened, uh, where we see it going, okay. Um, so I'll go over just the basic outline of, of how I'd like to uh, discuss it today, and then we'll talk about why we wanted it. 
know, why we here at Columbia wanted it, um, then how we went through choosing the system we chose. Um, briefly go over some of the results we had, and I'm not talking numbers, I'm not talking that, I'm talking about um, issues we had or issues we didn't have or uh, things that surprised us, things that didn't surprise us. Um, the present, where we are right now uh, with velocity-based training and then where I see it going, uh, both for us and, and for the future of it. Um, and, and, and some exciting things I think are, are coming up with that for sure. All right, so that's just in a nutshell why we're, we're doing this presentation today. All right, so let's take it back a bit and then just a brief uh, talk about my own experience with velocity-based training. And it, and it goes all the way back to uh, 2004. So at Rutgers at the time, uh, Jay Butler was the head strength and conditioning coach. He, he still is actually, he's at, he's at his second stint there now. And we had the opportunity to expand the building and the facility and a new room was built and um, we had an opportunity to input some things into the room. And Jay is very intelligent, uh, an engineer by trade. Um, you know, he ended up getting his master's down at ECU um, and uh, worked under uh, Jeff Connors. Um, but, but Jay is very intelligent, real good with numbers. Um, and, and Jay had come up with, he didn't, he obviously didn't invent Tendo, he didn't do any of that or Darfish, but Jay integrated Tendo and Darfish into a weight room that had 14 racks into the room. So you talk about being ahead of the curve, you know, he's a guy that had TVs up in between the racks, we had uh, Darfish set up on um, in between all of these racks. We had cameras um, all meant to monitor the list. Okay, so you're talking about teaching someone how to power clean or, or snatch or teaching someone to squat and, and positions or even speed work that we would do on the track that was in the weight room. Uh, the Darfish was an incredible addition to the room for that. And Jay also uh, integrated the use of tendo units within the room. So we all know what the tendo is. Um, and this is all the way back in 2004. Um, and Jay, over the course of years, so we, we, we didn't get that into the room 2005, 2006, and Jay wanted to find out what was the most effective training percentage for our football team. Where were we moving the weight the fastest and getting the the greatest result or the greatest return on investment um, uh, based on the load. And what we did is, and I, I want to say it was 2007, 2008, and, and I have all this data I, um, on a hard drive. It's an incredible amount of data and a, an incredible amount of work. Um, what we did is we took uh, the non-travel squad and for an entire semester, we recorded every single rep and every single set and, and manually wrote them down during the list um, of every non-travel player. And what we were calculating out was uh, at what percentage over the course of that semester were we, were we most powerful, okay? So in a nutshell, where were we, what percentage made us the most powerful? And then Jay calculated out that, you know, anywhere between the 76 to 80%, maybe some couple guys a little bit above 80, but in that range of up near 80%, we were most effective. And so from that, we, we figured out that, you know, that was going to be our training range. We needed to stay near that percentage at almost all times in order to be effective. Um, now, the gathering of that data, I, I can tell you, you know, as a young coach back then, having a clipboard and having in front of me three racks, so not up to nine guys, in, in moving from rack to rack to rack, getting the numbers off of the, the, the tendos. And you've all seen these tendos and you've all seen how they come in the little red. And I'm sitting there scrambling to get who just lifted, what was the weight, you know, inputting the, the, the power output, um, moving down to the next guy because they were getting, and I had to get every guy, every rep on every set. And this was every time we lifted. So a tremendous amount of data gathering 
and then a tremendous amount of input because then we put it all into Excel. And again, Jay, you go back to Jay being the engineer and this math guy, and he calculated out all this data himself. Okay, he, he did all this math. Uh, really impressive, super impressive. So we get all those results and we end up training that way for, I guess the remainder of our time uh, that we had there at, uh, at Rutgers. Um, so that was my initial experience with the velocity-based training was uh, the basic, the Tendo itself. Uh, moving forward, we, uh, we moved on to uh, the NFL. And, uh, I followed Jay and Coach Young to the NFL. And uh, Tampa had, you know, I want to say the Tampa didn't have them, and Jay purchased the Tendos. And uh, we ended up using them in Tampa. Um, not to the extent that we did uh, at Rutgers. And, th and there's reasons for that. I mean, you don't have the guys around as much as you do. Okay. And, and but you, we did use them, but not as much as we, we did at the college level. However, you know, in hindsight, we should have used them more. Um, but a great tool was available to us, but that was being used. Catapult was. You know, obviously that's an NFL thing. Everyone's got to use Catapult. Uh, so, you know, that was that was a huge data collection point for us, or more for Jay. You, you know, you know, Jay spent hours a day crunching those numbers. There was no guy at the time that was that was crunching numbers. It was all Jay. It was all the strength coaches. So we'd spend a lot of time uh, on on doing that analysis of data. Um, but that but that time in the NFL. Um, did a couple things for me. Okay, so it, it, it showed one, I think, you know, in hindsight, hindsight's always 2020. We all know that. Hindsight, we probably should have used that more. Uh, you probably could have started to explore other options for training the team, you know, especially as you look back now, um, as far as getting them information uh, or getting information from them while they're training, while they're away from the facilities, which they spend the majority of their time. Um, but a couple of things I learned in the NFL. The primary one was this, uh, was one, how hard they work, extremely hard. Uh, so I had, a, I had a misconception about NFL athletes that they didn't work hard, and they do. Uh, some of the hardest working guys I've ever met, some of the strongest guys I've ever met, Gerald McCoy or Ward Miller, uh, hardest working guys, the Dallas Clark, Rondé Barber, um, you know, just, extremely hardworking professionals. And the reason why is they want to be great, obviously they, they, to keep their jobs. Um, but what it also exposed me to is just a different way of training. Okay, so I had spent the prior 12 years, 11 years at the college level. And I, and I only was, was only exposed to one coaching style and one, uh, one way of doing things. Um, and what the NFL showed me is that there's a different way, a different way to coach, there's a different way to teach, uh, train, um, different philosophies. Okay, so th that that became a real important phase for me as I moved back into the college realm. All right, so I'll move on. And I'll touch on some of these things again. So again, I'll, I'll bounce back to just a couple of these as we go. So. Why velocity-based training? So now I'm back at I'm back at the college level in Mac Columbia. Um, I spent my first year alone. So I had 110 people. I uh, I was by myself. I was the only coach. I had a volunteer, and thank God I had him. Um, but it was me and 110 guys. So had its challenges. All right. Um, new head coach comes in, Al Bagnoli, and uh, Al's Al's been great. Al's been great for this program, and Al's been great for me. Um, I can't thank him enough. Okay. Um, I got assistance finally. I uh, got a great assistant and a guy named Matt King. Uh, Matt King's up at UConn now, for anyone that knows him. And I got a young guy, Frank Lasanti, who's still with me. And I'd be lost without him. Okay. Um, he's one of two assistants I have. Will Frederick is another young guy that I have with me. So, and again, I, I wouldn't be where I am without the two of them. So, it's important to mention who they are. But throughout all these times that having Matt here, having, uh, um, you know, Frank and Will, in, in, in talking with people throughout the course of the industry, there's conventions, 
Um, the thing that I kept coming up with was how strong is strong enough? When are our guys strong enough? Like, why would I possibly want to continue to follow the same training program for some of my older guys? And we say older guys, these are more mature lifters um, and they could be juniors. They could, you know, most likely they're seniors. They reached that senior year, they're rising seniors. But why would I ever want to follow the same training protocol, the same linear progression, and take their 610 squat max and bring it to what? 615? 620? I mean, how big of a jump are you gonna are you gonna make? And then does that jump warrant the risk of the of the continual loading on this athlete? So these are the things that are in my mind. Um, and, and this goes for bench and this goes for clean. Um, you know, it's just constant wear and tear on the athlete. And, and, you know, you start to think there's got to be a better way. It's in, in, even way back in the day, you know, we used to talk about uh, we have a light day. We call it a, te a technique day where we just want to move weight fast. Right. You just want to move weight fast. Well, how do you know it's fast? Someone say, how'd that look? Well, that look good. <laughs> what do you base that off of? <laughs> How do you know it was fast? So that was always in the back of my mind, right? I, I, I start to think about these kids and, and some of these kids that get hurt. You know, some of these players that hurt their backs and, and not, not that they didn't ever play again, but you're like, this just got to be a better way. There has to be a better way. So, and that leads into training smarter. Okay. So uh, you take uh, all these people. So we'll go to, to Dr. Mann and you go to the conventions and hear everyone talk about it. And you have to be able to integrate some of the science that they're talking about and bring that back to your program and then start to get it up to date and, and, and continue to move forward and grow. OK, so never stagnate. Always try to continue to grow. Um, so as old school as I am, I'm still someone that always wants to try to continue to grow because God knows I definitely don't know it all at all. I'm the first one to tell you that. I know some things, but I definitely don't know everything. That's for sure. Um, so reducing the risk of injury um, was, was the primary thing for me. Because right? to me, there just had to be a better way. Um, getting athletes excited and engaged. Now, the, the way we train, and if you've ever seen a video from our room or, or how we train or what we do, it is, it is a charged room. It's an excited room because when you train without cards and you train without phones and you train in this group where everyone is straining to do work at the same time together as a team, um, it becomes a charged environment. Um, they get excited about it. I tell them all the time, the only thing you need to bring to a Columbia weight room is just energy and effort. That's it. You're not writing anything down. You don't have to worry about anything. Everything is there for you. There were sheets up. Uh, every number you needed to know was there. There was a clear explanation. You just need to bring effort and energy. Okay. Um, but one of the things was uh, these kids, this, this, these kids today, and they operate off this stuff. They thrive off this technology. So getting them excited and engaged with, uh, with this technology, you know, it's something we talked about for a long period of time. I, I talked to some of the kids about it. They all knew that some kids here had been using um, Team Builder. Again, I have a counterpart downtown, the Olympic strength coach, Tommy Sheehan. Um, they use Team Builder for some of their teams. And, and that's fine. That's that's the way they train. Uh, some of our kids knew about it and would ask questions as to why we didn't. And then we'd give them an explanation. Um, we found velocity-based training would be a great way to drive competition. Um, these kids come here, they're highly motivated. Now they know that they're not going to the NFL. It's a different, it's a different kind of motivation. Some of them can, don't get me wrong. There's some good football players. And these kids come here and they work hard. They're competitive. They're, they're competitive uh, in the classroom, but they're also very, very competitive in the weight room and, they're, and on the field. You know, don't ever, don't ever uh, underestimate that about an Ivy League football player. Highly competitive athletes never ceases to amaze me uh, about these kids, about how hard they work and how much they care. Um, and then we talked about, we wanted it for the efficiency of training. Um, being able to adapt quicker, whether the, rather than me having to wait or, or sit there and monitor a lift and sit there and you know have a meeting after with the staff and say, 
that sucked or, or, or you know, whatever it may be, or just having our opinions. I'd rather have hard data. Okay. So I, I, I'd like to find out, you know, if we're in week three of camp or whatever it may be. And, uh, and, and visually I thought the list sucked. Well, what, what, what did the data show? What did the actual science show and how, what changes can we make based off of that? And then, you know, we all know that with velocity-based training, you can make changes right in the middle of a lift, right in the middle of a set, where I, there are things you can do to make changes. So uh, we wanted it for that, uh, that portion as well. Um, data. So let's, data collection. I mean, it's not just this platform. It's not just push. But these platforms out there, the data collection is incredible. So for anyone that's not using it right now, it is mind boggling the amount of data that you can collect. Uh, I haven't even scratched the surface. One, I don't have enough data to scratch, okay? And I'll get into that as we go on as well, but I don't have enough data stored. Um, no longer do you have to input data like I did in 2006, seven and eight, you know, by hand into Excel and then figure out formulas with Excel. This is doing it for you and it is doing it instantaneously. And then that information can be brought to a sport coach. So obviously right now it's just football, uh, but all this information can be brought up to a staff meeting and then broken out to them in a language that they can understand. Okay, probably the language that I need to understand because anything more scientific than that, I'm screwed. Um, my young guys, they, they my, my young guys are my science guys, just so you know, Frank and Will. So. They keep, they, they keep me in check with the science. All right, so that's basically why we were looking at a velocity-based training for us here at Columbia. That was the initial thought process for us, all right? Um, and then it comes down to obviously choosing uh, the right platform. And nice play there, Cato, with choosing the right platform and showing the platforms. I like that. Um, so our process, let's, let's go through that real quick. Um, we took our time. Okay, so we've been talking about it for a while. Um, and in 2018, I, we, we, we had to get something done. I knew it was time. Uh, we needed to get something done. I, I was really concerned about the kids. Um, and again, this goes back to that NFL thing where you look at well-developed athletes and how they train. And, and what you need to do, uh, you need to have longevity. And, and with some of these stronger kids, you need to have that longevity. So, um, we, but we did take our time in the, in the search process. So in 2018, um, I remember Matt Herhall here at Columbia, he forwarded me, um, uh, it was Bailey's name from Push, had a quick conversation with him. Um, and then, not long after that conversation, I came into contact with this guy named Dara Whalen. And Dara Whalen worked out of the, I, I, I got, I don't want to get this wrong, but it was University of Ireland, but he worked for a company called Output uh, Scientists. And he had come up here, he'd been in America touring through colleges, and he was asking American strength coaches what they were looking for in a velocity based training. So he asked if we could meet, and I'm like, you know, Irish guy, I'm an Irish guy, sure, let's meet. Um, he came here to the room and he had an initial, uh, his product wasn't on the market yet. And he had a, um, an example of it on his phone and, and a little sensor. And uh, we talked, what was I, what would I look for? What are the things that I would want? And what would I want to measure? And how would I measure? And how did the lift go? And how did we train? And just a ton of questions with this guy. And again, a super, super intelligent dude. Really, really smart guy. Um, someone who we considered. Uh, in a product sense, but they weren't ready to go when we were ready to purchase. Okay, so, and again, uh, there, are, there are a lot of great products out there, but it's, again, choosing what's right for you. Um, they weren't ready to go. Would we have chosen them? I don't know. I, I can't tell you that, but it is an amazing product. A right? super smart guy, opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, really enjoyed meeting him, and I've met him a couple times. Um, Jordan Burke down at Open Barbell. He's down in Brooklyn. Okay, uh, we we talked heavily with him. Got a proposal from him. Um, another very very intelligent guy in an amazing product. So a lot of you guys know about the Open Barbell um, 
uh, sensor they use, a lot like the Tendo one, much easier and much more cost effective. Um, but their their platform had expanded to similar to what Push had, um, even though I still hadn't met with Push yet. But uh, definitely a product we looked at in, in what Jordan did and why, why I bring up Jordan is, is I told Jordan my, why I wanted to get velocity-based training about the older guys. And I wanted to measure them and blah, 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 about how I was concerned about their development and their growth and then the loading. And he said, but why would you not want to just record the data for everybody? And, and I said to myself, and a good, great point. Yeah, why wouldn't I? Why do I not want to get the data from a, a freshman? I'm sorry, first year. Uh, from, uh, from a first year athlete. Why would I not want to record that data on them? Good, bad, who cares? Just get the data. The more data, the better. Okay, and from that, you can disseminate and make decisions. So really smart, uh, great conversations with Jordan. Um, great product as well. Um, uh, Jay at Butler at the time was at IMG. Uh, I, I, I'm talking to Jay. They had I can't remember what they had down there, but it, um, it wasn't push. Um, we Jay and I talked. You know, I trust Jay with a lot of things, and I told him where it's going. And um, so he gave some insights on some things, and really enjoyed. Again, such a such an intelligent person, um, really well thought out uh, on the way he thinks in, in things, and I and I, I value his opinion highly. Uh, um, Dan Worth, the University of Tennessee, a great, great talk. So Dan, Dan and I talked, and I thought it was the most down-to-earth talk I had. Um, he told me what worked, what didn't work. Um, did the athletes like it, not like it? Um, it was a very, very, a very, very non-scientific conversation, which is what I wanted. I, I didn't want to hear about um, velocity zones anymore. It's, it's not what I wanted to hear about. I wanted to hear about, did the, did the damn thing work? And now what we were talking about was push. So great guy. I can't thank Dan enough. I, I don't think he realizes how much he played in the decision-making process for push. Um, and, then, and then push itself. So, you, you know, you look at, I met with them um, here. Um, I met with them down in Washington, D.C. Uh, the, the, the president of their company came here. If I'm, you know, I'm sure Bailey will correct me later, but uh, he actually came to the weight room. This was after we had met in D.C., and, and he gave us a sensor to try, and, and he gave us just a great explanation of what was going on and how it works, and just, you know, an outstanding um, presentation by everyone in, in at that company. So, um from all that, we had to make the decision what was right for us, okay? Uh, what was best for Columbia University? What was going to be best for this program going forward? And what platform uh, gave us that? All right, so that's where we are as far as the process of all this. Um, and then why we decided on push, okay? So again, I, I mentioned it before, there are amazing platforms out there, really, truly, uh, but push was right for us, okay? And uh, some of the key factors in that uh, were the people, and I've mentioned them a couple times. Um, they're great. And, and guys, there's no specific order in this. So, you know, one to six, there's no specific order. Um, but the first thing that popped in my mind was, was them. From, from, from my first interactions with them to yesterday, uh, when we were talking about this, um, responsiveness. <laughs> I mean, we, we have a problem, we send a text, they respond and, and, you, and you get an answer and you get a solution. Or if you don't get a solution, they'll tell you they'll get a solution. Um, it, it, it's outstanding. And, that, and that's, what's, that's what you need, especially, in, and I think we all understand this, and, 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 Bailey, and Bailey understood this, is that it, you know, the way that we work, and, and you know, you've got a 50 minute lift in this room, I can't have downtime and I, and I can't have screw ups. Um, so I need answers and I need solutions. And that's what they're all about. So uh, their responsiveness. Um, and I've touched on their, um, the explanation, the demonstrations, their on-site visits. Um, they really, really went overboard. It was great. I, I can't think enough. Um, the system itself is user-friendly. <laughs> um, user-friendly for the kids, 
I mean, you're going to find out when you do this, if you haven't done this yourself, you're going to, you're going to find out that, I mean, they know more than you anyways. Once you show them what it is, they, they pick it up pretty damn quick. Um, and, and they were picking up some stuff that I'm like, Jesus, how did, how did this kid figure this out? <laughs> but the, the kids are, are very, very bright. Um, it's idiot proof for me, which it has to be. Um, but it's so easy to use. Uh, I, I don't, and again, I've only scratched the surface on this. And, um, but it, it's easy. And then the more you use it, the easier it gets. Um, well, not, this was a big one for me. It was the potential and uh, for me, what seems to be a seemingly unlimited growth of the system itself. So the platform itself, um, th this thing can continue to grow. So that sensor has so many more things that it's capable of having put, put into it. And, and the guys from Push know what I'm talking about, but it already does so much and it can do so much more. And, you, and you're all part of that update. So you want you buy into the system, you know, push your, your part of these updates. So it, it just, when you look down the road as to what they're going to be able to put into this thing, it's just an untapped potential. And, and, and I'll touch on it probably at the very end about what I think, where we're going, where I see the future of it. Okay, so I'll leave that for the end. Um, Competition-based. They offered that leaderboard, uh, the leaderboard within their system is for me and the staff, um, tremendous. Uh, you know, you talk about, getting the kids involved and getting the kids excited well they did the leaderboard uh which is something we have in the room we got a we we got a 90 inch tv brought in with this too so it sits right in the middle of the room and again i've got a u-shaped room and the tv sits up there but everyone can see it so you've got this espn type leaderboard showing who's first and trust me these kids want to know who's first okay um that was a huge factor um and then the last one and again, no order was affordability. So as you go through and you and you and you do your list and you run down those columns, you choose. All right. So you choose and affordability wise. I mean, again, you make your own decision with that, but it worked for us. Um, so starting slow. So we bought the system now. We're in a push, and we decided we're going to roll it out in January of 20. Um, so we met with Bailey. Um, but I also, again, we'd spoken to a bunch of people and people who had push. Um, and what we did find out is it rolling out push for everyone on the first day <laughs> was probably not the smart thing to say. As everyone looked back again, hindsight's 2020, they, everyone was like, yeah, probably not a bright idea. Okay. So it was, it was an issue. It would be, I could definitely see the issue if I rolled out, I have 14 racks. If I rolled out 14 iPads in this room and then, three guys per platform, I'm looking at all these questions coming my way in, in a matter of minutes and just being overwhelmed, okay? Um, so we decided to go with what's called just starting slow and Bailey agreed that it just seems to be that metered approach is the way to grow. Um, so we were gonna integrate that into the system. And, and what we did is, and it's what we always do, and we are what's called, a, we're a teach every program and everything we do, we talk to the kids. I, I, I let you know and, and my staff and everyone, we let the kids know what we're doing, why we're doing it, why this exercise. They're, we explain everything to everybody so they know. We figure if you know, you'll do it with a, a greater intent. Okay? Talk to your kids. Okay? Don't, you know, don't shy away from that. D tell them. This is what we're doing. So we had a team meeting and we talked about it, about what velocity-based training is. Uh, brief science stuff for them. Although, they, again, probably they know more than me. Um, they will understand it. And then, I, you know, some will. Uh, we're some of the dumbest smart kids on the planet. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of you guys will understand that. Um, but these kids, are, these kids are very, very intelligent, um, especially here. They're very, very smart kids. Um, so how do we start slow is uh, we met with Bailey. We talked about... Um, what we needed to learn as a staff. And we agreed that we wanted to meathead our way through it. And that's what we did. So initially we got it started. If, if, we, if we got log jammed on something, we wrote down the questions and then we'd call and meet with them, with the staff from PUSH and they'd answer our questions and then we continue forward. So we wanted to work through the bugs ourselves. And I think that's a great way to do it. Um, so that if there is a bug out on the floor, 
you've already hit that bug, or hopefully you have, and then you can answer that question in an effective way that's going to make sense to the kid. Okay, so we did that ourselves. We, I wanted to have all those problems. I wanted to have these headbanging moments in my office, and I think Frank and Will would agree there were headbanging moments in here. You know, someone might have sworn, and it may have been me more than once. Um, so we, 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 we went with that. We, we had the meeting. We, we, the kids knew what was going to happen. And, and we started with one rack and the way that our room is set up in this U shape is this first rack, which is I can right outside my office here. It, it's set up in a great way for this group training setting because our strongest athletes are on rack one. And as you move around the room and you get over to 14, those are the weakest guys. So in my room, I know that when I'm coaching, I can stand out in that middle and my two assistants are moving around the room, being active, and I can shoot and troubleshoot in the room. But I'm going to pay a little bit more attention, obviously, to, the, to that left side of the room where the guys are a little bit weaker. OK, that right side right over here, my rack one, two, three and four. Those are my mature lifters. These are the guys I was talking about. These are the guys that have been in the program for a few years. These are the guys that have really, really good technique. I really only need to see if we're doing four triples at 84. I probably only need to see one of their sets at 84 to see how they're doing, but I need to see the other kids in the room. So the way the room's set up, it's a great way to coach. Um, and you don't have young guys mixed in with older guys. We mix up the young and old when it comes to supplemental work. And that's where the old man teaches the young buck how to train. But when it comes to the core lifts, we tend to keep those older, more mature guys together. Um, and then we'll coach the living daylights out of those young kids. So anyways, we got our three, I think it was three old linemen that jumped this thing off for us. We explained it, showed them how to do it, and they went through it. And we went through probably that first week with just them. And then it was, we added on two racks. And then we added on a couple more, and then a couple more. Um, until they were comfortable, and until we were comfortable. And, and remember, we got multiple groups coming in, and and you were doing that every, every lift. Um, but all of a sudden, four or five weeks into this thing, everybody's... Everybody's got it. Everyone has it, okay? Um, through that process of going slow, we had to learn, uh, I, I, that we had to learn to manage athlete expectations. So, um, you know, they would come up to you, coach, I, this, this rep didn't come up, it didn't show, I didn't hit the button in time. You know, um, we would say, we would, uh, Frank would say, listen, it's not the end of the world, nothing bad's gonna happen. It's okay to miss a rep. And, and, and Bailey even let us know, listen, sometimes the sensor's not going to get it. If that's technology, and it is what it is. And and it isn't the end of the world. And, and, and it, for me, it's definitely not. Um, and neither are rogue numbers. Okay, and we'll talk about them as well. Um, so, you know, managing the expectations of the kids, and, and, and they knew. Um, they knew what it was, and, and they knew what, what we were looking for, too. So we would always start the lift with, hey, listen, we're looking for uh, – blah, 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 meters per second today. So this is the number we have to hit. This is what we're shooting for. And Okay, so they, the kids all knew what we're looking for. And then um, they knew how to get to that point. And, and just so you know, they also know how to cheat it. Or they try to cheat it. Um, and then the other thing was, is uh, you have to make sure when you're going slow, is that um, me, myself, and my staff, you guys just rehearse multiple scenarios. What if situations? And because a bunch of them came up, and some we weren't ready for, and, and that's fine. And, you know, I'm a real, I'm real easy when it comes to that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I can still continue to train the room, but we would definitely have situations in the room um, that we didn't prepare for. And that's fine. Uh, and, and we knew that going into it as a staff, all right? Um, and that problem. So that leads to adapting to challenge. I don't know if, if, if everyone can see the screen just real quick. That one on the right side of the screen, that's rack one. And that's my office off to the right. But that would be where our strongest guys are. So this is what I'm talking about, a U-shaped portion of the room. Okay. So if everyone wanted to understand a visual of what I was talking about. Um, adapting to challenges during the implementation. So uh, during and after uh, off recordings. Um, rogue numbers. A couple times, and Bailey, Bailey had told us this, and, and Dara had told me that, and Dan had told me that. Uh, you're going to get rogue numbers, okay? So, and, and that's just, it's just part of it, um, extremely high. Uh, missed recordings. Yeah, you might miss a rep here and there. Some kids missed a set. Um, 
simple things. Okay, and it's for the most part, guys. It's usually a human error. Uh, I, I, technology error, I, very rarely. Maybe maybe the off maybe the off numbers that the, these extremes that came up, but they're few and far between. Very very few and far between. Um, you know, we did we did find that the kids would figure out a way during a squat where they figured out a way that they could launch that bar off their shoulder, they could peak that number. So we taught them real quick that if they saw one of the guys in the platform doing that, they would call bullshit on, on the number that registered up on the board. So if someone was up on the board with this exceptional meters per second, a guy go and he'd go, nah, he, he'd launch that shit off his shoulders. You know, he, again, these kids are very, very bright. And when we ran it, just so you know, we ran into that same issue back at Rutgers where kids would try to, you can do that with a tendo, okay? You can you can tweak those numbers by by launching that bar off your shoulders. Uh, Miss recordings happens. Software freezing, I, and what I mean by software freezing is more. In, in, <laughs> this was definitely me. Uh, more the TV, uh, trying to get the leaderboard right, and 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 you know it. That's more me. I, I wouldn't say it's a software freezing, but that's. Uh, probably setting it up right, things like that. So there's there's things that might go on with Wi-Fi in the room, but it's not push. You know, it's not the it's not the platform. It's probably more that than anything else. Is what we've learned is it's probably more that. Um, not setting the proper metric. So again, th and this is the science, and this is where we're going to continue to learn. Uh, so this is a challenge. Uh, what is the right range you know what is the the right strength speed the right speed strength the right uh if if, if, if we're looking at going uh, max strength what what is the right meters per second what is the exact range I, I still to this day can't find the the exact right and I, and I think even Dr. Mann has touched on where he says even he doesn't know but you can find generalized ones but uh, sometimes we we set the wrong metric and we needed to pick the right one and we're still in the process of finding out what what it is we want to measure okay um, and the last thing we ran into was athletes in the wrong group. So the room is set. So everyone knows where they're lifting, who the lifting group is. And it's, um, it's pretty set. Sometimes though, especially here at Columbia, um, you're getting kids in the wrong group. Okay. Uh, that's a problem. They show up at the wrong time. They come up on a bus. That kind of throws things out of whack. But those are some of the challenges we had. Um, our plan was initially to use push during spring ball into the summer. So we were going to take all the maxes we had during our max strength phase, uh, which ended on March 14th, um, and then use those numbers in spring ball, um, and then allow the athlete to add load if they exceeded the velocity threshold we had set. Okay, so that, this is where we're going to move on into this next step. We, we were uh, following this phased approach This starts slow, and we're going to continue to grow with this program. All right, so we finished max testing on the 14th. All right, um, the data collection that we were going to use in spring ball was going to help us throughout the course of the summer. So we get generally 40 to 50 people here in the summer. Uh, not a lot. Again, not a scholarship school. For those who don't know, we do not offer scholarships. Uh, these kids pay their own dime to come here and stay in the summer. Um, so half the team's home and less than half the team's here. Um, but we were going to use that push over the course of the summer to gather more data and then for me, I was going to continue with that velocity-based approach for my seniors. I, you know, I promised them that I'm not going to load them up before their final season. Again, to put five pounds on your bench or 10 pounds on a squat, it's not worth the risk. It, I'm just telling you, it's just not worth the risk to do that. You can train. And this is the whole reason about velocity-based training. If you move this weight fast, you can still stay strong. You can still be powerful. Okay, so that that for me was, was a huge thing with these older guys. Um, the younger guys were still going to follow a linear based approach uh, uh, for uh, both the young guys and for anyone that was staying at home because there was no way to measure what you were doing at home. Okay, again, so that was all what was supposed to happen. <laughs> so on March 14th, COVID happened. We got shut down uh, permanently. Um, so everything went out the window. Um, I naively, I guess, and maybe I, am I naive or maybe the whole world was, I, I thought that at some point we would come back. So we initially sent out plans, uh, programs for guys that had equipment, some that didn't, you know, they, we were scrambling to find out who had what, uh, you know, and that took a couple of days to figure that out. Um, 
but I kept having to change programs because they kept moving the, the, like everyone will say, they kept moving the goalposts on us. You know, I thought maybe we'd get back after, but we didn't. I thought maybe we'd get back for this June in the summer. We didn't. I thought we'd be back in August. We didn't. And all those times that happened, I had to make changes. I had to adapt percentages. I had a, we stopped running. I went, once August hit and they, and they hit us with, we're done for the fall. The first thing I did is we stopped running. Okay. Um, so all these changes were happening. Um, however, we did still see an opportunity for uh, velocity-based training concept, conceptually. Um, even without the sensor being at home with the guys. So what I did is I instructed the senior class um, to perform all their lifts, their core lifts, the clean, the squat, and the bench, as if they had the push sensor at home. They've all been exposed to it. They knew what it meant to train with intent, okay? They knew how to move the bar the way they wanted to move it. So their program was written in a different way. A lighter weight, um, where they were going to progress, they started lighter than the rest of the team, and they were going to progress up to just a very, very certain percentage where they were going to rep test. Um, and, and I got to tell you that when we did get to that point where we tested and we had everyone send in videos of their tests, I was, we were all shocked, you know, to see a senior class. And yes, they rep tested and we're a single rep team. We single and bench squat clean. Um, and, and yeah, I know, I understand that rep tests are different. You're going to get different numbers, but I'm talking, I'm talking big changes. And, and some of these guys were, you know, you're talking fourth year guys getting big numbers and definitely bigger than some of the younger kids um, who would follow a more linear progression. All right. Um, I would have to say that almost every senior got a new max in almost every lift that they weren't injured in. You know, these guys with shoulders, these guys with knees. Um, so you all know how that all works. Um, but really, really shocking in a good way uh, that, that you could see that, yes, Without any scientific data to back it up, without me having, having to do a study on it, guys followed a program that was lighter, and they just moved the weight fast. They moved it with intent, and they got stronger. And they got more powerful. So really reassuring for me, okay? Um, and again, this leads to the future, all right? So let's let's look at the present, um, where we are uh as we are right now. So in August, as a staff, we decided to take uh, uh, the leverage uh, block builder uh, that had been introduced into the program of push for remote programming for the team. Okay, so I was done with Excel. You do 20 weeks of Excel, you're done with it too. Um, so finished with Excel, I'm, I'm over it. The, 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 the platform itself, the Push Pro app is uh, incredible. Um, Should have done it sooner. My fault. You know, that's my fault. Um, this meant getting the entire team uh, onto the Push Pro app. We did that. Um, we met with the entire team, um, got them all online, got them on a Zoom, talked to them extensively about what we wanted to do. Um, this is, of course, after we had uploaded everything for them, and we did a quick demonstration as to what it was going to look like and went through it all with them. It discussed what we wanted to do with the program. Um, we were going to do something different. Uh, I've never done a strictly eccentric loaded program with our core lifts. Um, it's something we've not, never had an opportunity to do, and I told the guys that. We're not playing this fall, so let's try something different. And, and we are. We're, we're actually finishing up an eccentric phase uh, with our core lifts, and we're shifting to uh, more of an eccentric loading on our supplemental stuff. Um, we used uh, their ability to film. So again, you guys within within the Push uh, program and in the, the Push Pro app, uh, they have a, a library of videos, hundreds, hundreds. But it, you also have the ability to take your YouTube site and put up your exercises. And that's critical. For us, that was critical because our guys know our exercises. They know our verbiage. They know the way we do things. And they want to see us do it. And um, we've been able to upload those onto the into the block builder easily. Easily. Um, in, in not, not the first time. Um, and again, it goes back to we said that we wanted to work through the block builder on our own without uh, help from push. Um, and once we made the mistakes and we couldn't answer the question, then we'd reach for help. And, but what that does is that makes you better at it. It just, it, you, you won't make that mistake again, hopefully. Um, I thought we did a real good job with that and we continue to do a good job with it. Um, we force each other that, you know, one week it's me and one week it's Will and one week it's Frank. Um, keep your skills sharp. 
but we meet on a Monday. We discuss what we're doing for the week. We write out our plan for filming, what exercises we're going to be doing, how many exercises that aren't in the video that we need to film ourselves. We go out and get that done. We upload the program. We go through the program. And then we, we load it on and schedule it for the next week. Okay. Um, the rollout of the app, um, the kids knew because we prepped them. We knew, we told them we're going to have problems and I don't care. <laughs> You're going to have problems. Who cares? Hiccups is what we called it because it was the easiest way to do it. So during the first one to two weeks, more one than two, um, there were mistakes, but there were simple fixes. Sometimes a kid hit something he shouldn't hit. Sometimes we didn't do it right. Um, one time uh, we contacted Bailey and, and he said, oh, we were doing an update. That's why it wouldn't do that. So it was on there and they were doing an update to the system. And that's fine. It doesn't matter. Um, but it all made sense. And, and within two weeks, the kids got it. Um, just so you know, currently we're in, we're in phase two. This is the last day of uh, phase two, week one. Um, Implementing the system, implementing push in, in the Push Pro app um, has allowed us greater interaction with the team than ever before. More so than I would ever get from sending out those Excels. Incredible amount of, of, of communication with them on a daily basis to all three of us. Um, so that, that's been exciting for me. I really, I really, I really enjoyed that, to be honest, because um, obviously the Ivy League doesn't allow us to do anything with the kids. I can't do any Zoom coaching. I can't do any of it. <laughs> so everything for me is over the phone, through text and um, videos um, or Zoom meetings that we have. Um, and again, we get, we get great feedback from the athletes um, and the consensus on the app is overwhelmingly great. I, I haven't heard anything negative on the app. Every kid, every kid has been thrilled with it. I think they were as done with Excel as I was. Um, Within the app itself, there's a question on after every workout about RPE, um, and that gives us a good understanding about how the uh, the off-campus lifts are going. Um, you know, obviously your seven on a lift might be different than my seven, but it does give you just a good idea as to where the kids are, what they think of the lifts that they're doing. Um, so you get that. And again, that comes out in a data format for you, so it's easy to read, easy to understand. Um, the future, uh, <laughs> the future is definitely bright. I hope the one day that we actually get back onto a field. Um, I'm excited about it. Uh, one, we're, we're comfortable, the coaches, us, me, Will, Frank, we're very, very comfortable with this app. Uh, so are the athletes. Um, as of now, uh, 87 guys on the team right now have used push and have used the sensor in the room with the iPads that we have up. Um, those 87 are my future teachers. Okay, so obviously they're not all coming back next year. I know that. But those are my teachers. So yes, me, Will, and Frank. But once these kids understand it, they're going to impart that knowledge on the first years that are coming in. Okay, and, and that's super important to me. And that's how great the system is. That's another one of these great things about PUSH, about how easy it is to use, is that even the kids can teach the kids. Um, outstanding that uh, all of them know how to use that. Uh, obviously 110 of them are exposed to the Push Pro app, all right? Um, so where we see ourselves going with Push, the app in room in the sensor. So this is a combination of things for me. Uh, so if we took a, take a look at in season, this is where we see it going. You all know that you come in on a Sunday to lift after a game and you've got guys that played, okay, guys were on the bus, and on that bus, there were guys that played and guys that got in for six, seven, eight reps, the special teams guys, 10 reps. And then there are guys who just took the bus as just backups. And then you got the group of the non-travel. So in your room on a Sunday, my my goal is, is to be able to, and this is where I'll go all the way back to the beginning of being an old school coach. Okay. This is where my when my offensive group comes in and my guys that play. 60, 70 plays, they're going to get three iPads, four iPads, and they're going to go. I'll warm up the group, but then they're going to go and lift because their lift is going to be very, very different because the guys that traveled and didn't play, you know, they're going to be on a platform and they're going to get coached hard. Okay, so I'm going to deal with them. Um, I'm going to, you know, the non-travel is its own group. So um, 
but the guys that are now that, that traveled and played a bit and didn't play, they're going to follow a different program on push. And then you've got guys that are injured in the back. Um, I'm re really not monitoring or push. Um, but that's taking away, that's taking an old school coach who's giving up some of that, that control over the group and saying, okay, fellas, here you go. This is your pad. This is your workout. Go get this done. And, and you're out. And the great thing about push is at the end of it, I get to see what you did. Okay. So if you, if you pull in some bullshit, if I first swear, Bailey, um, if you're pulling some bull, I'm going to be able to know what you did in that lift. And I'll just pull you aside on Monday or Tuesday and be like, hey, can you explain to me what you were doing or what you weren't doing during this lift? And if I need to treat, you know, if I need to treat that person a certain way, I'll treat that person like a young person again. But you want to trust your mature lifters that they're going to get that work done. Um, and I do trust my guys. Um, but but push gives you that opportunity to monitor all that, and that that's exciting stuff. And that's that's an old coach who's giving up some of that control, and 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 because this is the way things would go, and this is the way I envision things going, and the way they should go, to be honest. Um, and again, the push app was it, the push is going to allow us to do that throughout the course of the year. Um, I'm just about to wrap this up. So um, efficient, accurate testing in my eyes. So uh, Obviously, all the barbell testing that you can do off a rep test is, to me, has been fairly accurate. We've done a couple of them, and, and it's meted out to be pretty accurate. So um, it also allows you to do vertical jumps. It also allows you to do some stuff with throwing that we want to do with quarterbacks. So, and again, unlimited potential for this platform. Um, the, the data collection, <laughs> un, un, unbeaten, the, the amount of data that you can collect. Um, you could store that they're storing and then the comparisons over the course of time, my God. And again, I haven't even touched comparisons because we don't have enough data. Um, and the next thing is this. So this is the more, the more exciting one if you, took a, if you look at potential. And again, this is my school. This is not a D1 school where everyone is on scholarship and everyone's on campus. I, I lose my guys throughout the course of the, your time or an extended period of time. I don't see them. So my goal is and I, I spoke with Bailey about this. I'm going to meet with, I'll set up a Zoom, and I'm going to meet with the last four classes of Columbia football grads. My goal is to do a presentation similar to this and tell, they all know this is what I wanted to do. I'll show them the platform, how it works, what the sensor is, and what it does for a football player. And they're going to understand it because they were all seniors at one point. They've all been through the program. And the goal is for each of them to sponsor a sensor to try to get 50 sensors sponsored, all right? So with those 50 sensors, now when my guys go home for the summer, they sign out a sensor, they're responsible for that sensor, and they go home and train. And now the data collection you can get from these kids while they're home, while you're training a team here on campus, but then the, the amount of data you can get is just unlimited and exciting. And, and to me, just the potential is unlimited for where you're looking to go as we train athletes into the future with uh, velocity-based training. Um, and to touch on, you know, like I said, if if they figure out a way, if, if push figures out a way to get a GPS inside that sensor, that's a game changer. That is that is an absolute game changer. You get a GPS inside this sensor, and then you're gonna put you're gonna put anyone that does just GPS work out of business. I mean, I want you to think about that going ahead. You know, that's future stuff, that's science stuff, but that is exciting things that can be done on this platform. And again, another reason why I chose this platform um, is the growth potential, okay? Um, pretty sure that was it. I, I, know, I know that went long and I, I, I tend to babble a lot, but uh, I, I just hope that, um, that it helps someone um, in, in, in your selection process. Uh, and again, not scientific-based, that's not me, but uh, just what we went through, our current experiences, and where we think this thing can go. Um, you know, again, and again, if you have questions uh, about it, you know, please definitely feel free to obviously reach out to me. But I mean, we can definitely go through some now if, if we have some. 
Yeah, Coach Bob, I just want, obviously, we want to thank you for, for coming to the table today and, and, and giving us a, a really good presentation. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. We have a couple good questions, so we'll open up the floor here. Um, first question is from Parker, actually. Uh, he said, what's the simplest way you found to explain uh, what VBT is trying to do, both to athletes or parents, or in this example, even sport coaches or ADs? Uh, good question. Uh, we did have to present this to uh, my boss, the assistant athletic director, and uh, the head football coach. And the head football coach is very much about, he's all about heavy one rep max, which is fine, as am I. Um, but he was wary of this. And uh, we sat the kids down in, in, uh, in, in the team room. Um, and we the, the way we explained it to them was, without using any science, we just said, you're going to take a load and you're gonna to try to move that load fast. This is called a submaximal load, okay? The theory is, we told them the theory that the scientists have talked about is that if you take that submaximal load and you move it at a certain velocity, the theory is that you can continue to get strong and powerful. That was the most simple way we could put it to them. Um, the way that we should explain, like we do a speed squat day, guys, uh, just so you know, uh, it, we, we've been doing speed squat. For, we always do that at the end of the week. So we do a fast Friday. We move weights fast, okay? Um, so you're looking at a 48%, eight doubles of 48% or whatever it may be. Um, but we tell them to move the weight fast. Well, they didn't know what fast was. So we gave them a better explanation of what that was, the intent behind moving that weight. And now they understand that if they do move this weight in this manner, they can still get strong, and especially this, especially the senior group. I think they saw that themselves. I think they were shocked. So I guess that's the easiest way to explain it. I hope that answers the question for you. Yeah, Coach, that was a, a fantastic answer. I got another question here. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be upon athletes returning back to campus and, and resuming on-campus training? They're sport coaches. <laughs> That's going to be their biggest challenge. Um, strength coaches are going to be looking out for the athletes, period. Um, I, I, I'm going to go slow. I don't care what they've been doing. I don't care what the numbers I've seen. I, I, the videos I've seen, it doesn't matter. The greatest challenge is going to be the sport coach. And the sport coach is going to want to get them back fast. And, too, and in my opinion, too fast. Um, my, my advice to anyone is go slow, <laughs> go slow, uh, take everything, uh, again, an immediate approach on what you do with these kids. That to me is the most dangerous thing. I'm, I'm more wary of the sport coach than anything else. That's a great answer. Uh, obviously we're, we're a little bit over the hour. So in, in the essence of time, we're going to sign off here, but if you do have any questions for coach Gil Martin, feel free to, to reach out to the push team. We're happy to pass them along. Uh, again, Coach, we want to thank you for sitting down with us. It was a great presentation, uh, and uh, thank you again. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. It was great being here.